Okay. Here's a random variable. Or here's an experiment. We throw a die. The random variable is defined to be the pips that you get on the roll. Binomial. Patrick shaking his head no. I'm hearing lots of, we got Shelby shaking her head no. We got John shaking his head no. All, okay, I'm hearing lots of no's. No? no, no. All in favor of no. Yeah. Any discussion needed? No. Yes. <laughs> Why is it not binomial? It's only there's six sides on a die. In order for it to be binomial, you have two outcomes. Six doesn't count. Good. Six is called multinomial. Multinomial. We'll build that 244. Good. So it's not binomial because you have too many outcomes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. 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 Good. Okay. I'm going to change the wording a smidge. So now. I can accept either yes or no, it's not binomial. My question more is, can we treat it as though it were binomial? Yes. yes. So and to answer that question effectively, ask yourself what you're interested in. You're betting, yes? It's a yes or no. It's either you're going to get a three or you're, or you're not. So if you roll a die one time, you can keep track of how many threes you get, yes? Mm -hmm. You're either going to or you're not going to. We can make this binomial. Yes. Now, since you can make it binomial, create a distribution for it using your, using your program. That's why I want to make sure everybody got the program. Now create the distribution. So I want to see, let me see if I can get this. Uh, let me pull the camera back a smidge so we can make sure that we can see. Uh, I'm going to try to do, I think what I'll do is, is do this. But I think most of what we need is, oh, maybe. That might be good, Stace, yeah. Say that again. Uh, you can do second mode that'll be here. Yep. Anybody I just gave programs to, second mode gets you off of that screen. And I think we can just. You guys don't want to know what's going on right here. Perhaps vertically. I can turn this off. Okay, so program. Uh-huh. Which one? Dist fill. This is a good review from yesterday. Dist fill. Now I asked for smallest, what you, what you have to do in your mind is to find the random variable you're interested in. What are you interested in? Three. Whether or not you got one, yes? I mean, you're throwing a die. You're, you're going to throw it one time. So the smallest number of times you could get a three would be zero. You might not. You might not. So zero would be, would be the smallest number of times you get a zero. Or a three, excuse me, a three. But if you're only throwing it one time, the largest is one. It's going to be a very, going to be a very interesting distribution. And it is going to be binomial because we know it either happens or it doesn't. With what probability does it happen? One one with one sixth probability. So when you throw a die, there's a one sixth chance you're going to get your three. It means it's a five sixth chance that you won't. But the beautiful part about this is it takes care of all of that. So when it says done, I know it's not very exciting. It's done. Yeah. <laughs> so where's the interesting stuff? No, it's on your list. Yes, in L1 and L2. So your stat <laughs> editor, that's the interesting stuff. So you've got a five sixth chance of not rolling a three and a one six chance of rolling a three. I know this is a pretty boring distribution, but I figured after a 48 hours apart from each other, as long as we can recognize that one is binomial, the one before it is not, we can then build on that and make it more interesting. Is that fair, yes? Maybe. Yeah. Tell me, ask me questions if you have them. Okay, so like, it is small, it's usually the yes. largest, and then it goes to binomials. Yes. And then Pick that and then put in the probability. The probability either has to be known or derived or given to you. So we knew the chance of rolling a, six, a three is one in six. Yeah. That's where that went in for that chance. So in probability, mm -hmm. one six. One six, yep. Okay. Who's so far? Try another one. Does this right here describe a binomial experiment? Yeah. We're going to move away from dice here momentarily. But I like to start, I like to start with these. I hear a vote for no. Christina says no. I have you shaking her head no. I hear lots of no's. <laughs> is that, is that, a, is that a, all in favor of no? Oh, not so much. Not so much. Okay, okay, we are. Yes. Well, why is it not? Those of us that say no, it's not. Why is it? Why is it not binomial? Same as the other one. Just that. <laughs> well, I, mean, it's it's just <laughs> I like that. Okay, good. So, what what part of the binomiality did it break, John? Same as the last one that has too many outcomes. Too many outcomes, right? You got too many outcomes. You've got you've got two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, up to twelve. It's not binomial. It's eleven nomial. So you, you got that's a bit of a problem there. Good. So this is not binomial. We won't bother putting it in our TIs because 
There's no need to. Plus, we already did it in class together, if you remember back in the day. Okay, good. How about this? Could this be made binomial? Yes. Yes. I'm hearing some yeses, and then I'm hearing an ooh, mate, and then I'm hearing a no. I'm not saying that it has to be made. Okay, thank you. I'm not saying it, ha it, it has to be binomial. Can we view it as binomial? Okay, now we got, got an inch. She's, she's nodding her head yes. Claude. Mm -hmm. Let's think about this. Let's think about it. Good. I like this ring. I'm not saying it has to be. Can you think it, of it as binomial? You're betting on 7 or 11. So, what's going to happen at the end of the experiment of throwing the dice and betting on 7 11? You're either going to get a 7 or 11, or you're not going to get a 7 or 11. That's the way to make it binomial. It's like, it's like in craps. It's like in craps. When you throw the dice on the beginning of craps, you either win or move on, or you crap out at the beginning. But what, what about the 11? What about the 11? I'm saying is 7 or 11 means you win, oh. and a not 7 or 11 means you lose. See, but Renee, I'm not saying you can't make this triangle. Mm -hmm. You can make it 7, 11, and other. Totally. Got no problem with that. But I'm saying we can view it as binomial by saying how many times do we win this game if we play one time. That's, what I'm, that's all I'm saying, my friend. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And that's the beautiful part of, this, of the stat gray area. You can make this be trinomial if you want to. But we can knock it down and simplify it and make it binomial by treating betting 7 or 11 as one event. Go ahead, Heidi, what's on your mind? Well, at first, when, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking, well, okay, so you have 7 or 11, uh -huh. and you throw out all other Good. Results. You just made it binomial. 7 or 11, mm -hmm. everything else. You just made right. it binomial. So either Thank one you. of those yes. work. Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying, can we dilute this down and put it in here? I think we can. Yeah, I think we can. Adding up the results from yes, exactly, exactly, Madeline. This fill. Let's try it. Let's try it. So we're betting on seven or eleven. So we're interested on whether or not we win. What's the least number of times we win? We play a game one time. We might not. It's zero. Yeah. We might not win if you throw the dice and it comes up a sum of eight. We might get lost. So you didn't win. So zero is the is the smallest number of times you could win. If you play one time, what's the largest x going to be? Just one. We'll make this more interesting momentarily, I promise. Don't you have to throw the dice twice? Right, but it's one roll of two dice. Okay. You're keeping track of the end Rolls. result of throwing okay. two dice. Like in Chuckle Luck, we're gonna do, we'll deal with Chuckle Luck here momentarily as well. You throw three dice, but that counts as one pin, okay. one throw. And then you're keeping track of what happens on all the dice you've thrown. That's a very good question, John. Very good question. Chain it, go. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. I got all right, here we go. Now, the only we know it's by, we're treating it as binomial, so I think we're happy there. The trick here is knowing what's the likelihood of winning this game. How many times you can, how many ways you can get seven or eleven? Good, let's figure it out. Eight. Six, I hear a vote for eight. Out of thirty-six. Eight out of thirty-six. Where did eight come from, Dan? Eight was. Um, I looked back at the graph we used before, or the table. Well. <laughs> and so there were thirty-six different ways that the dice. You guys remember that? Yes, there were thirty-six yeah. ways to roll the dice. Good, and of those. I added the ways of seven and eleven. Did you add? Because it's a or sorry. Or. Or. Please. Hi. Sure. 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 Hi. Oh, we had to add up or, or. ors, right? So you can think about how many ways you can make a seven. We did this in class. One and six, six and one, three and, three and four, three and four, four, and three, four and three, four and four, four and three, two and five, five and two. There, that's too many. That's six. Plus the elevens, which is five and six, and six and five. And there's your eight ways, yeah? So there's eight possible ways to roll a seven or eleven, but there's 36 possible ways to roll two dice. So the chance of winning is going to be 8 out of that 36. Wait a minute. What? No. Oh, right. Yes. 36. Yeah, good. Right. There's 36. Okay. That's your sample space. Right. Yes. There's 36 total okay. ways to throw the dice. Yes. Is, that, is that fair? Yeah. Good, good. Okay, let's, let's run it. It says it's done. And it's not going to be the most interesting distribution. It's not going to be the most interesting distribution because it only has two, it only has two, two cells. Yeah, how did you get here? Yeah. Yep, yep. 
Yeah, it, it, it seems weird because we don't usually go there via that. Lauren, you got a question? Oh, I was just wondering, I was thinking that, well, for one, I can't even program this yet because I don't have the programming key or whatever. But um, I was thinking the probability, wouldn't it be, what, 50%? Why 50? Tell me why 50. Because you can either win or you can't by rolling two. That would be assuming. That would be assuming I gave you a pair of dice. That's a great question. What? I gave you a pair of dice and said roll it. If you roll even, an even sum, you win. If you roll an odd sum, you lose. In order for it to be 50-50, and I love what you're saying, you either win or you don't, but it's only 50-50 if the chance of winning is the same as the chance of losing. So the chickens, you either get a girl or you don't, right? You get a girl or you don't. You leave from the top of Mount Max, they're skiing down Mount Max, you either break your leg or you don't. <laughs> but, right? But you laugh because it's not 50 50. If it was, nobody would ski in Mount Max. So you can't, just because there's only two outcomes doesn't mean they're the same likelihood of outcomes. One dice with, and you want a one, two, or three. There you go. If you roll one die and you bet on one, two, or three, or four, five, and six, that's 50 50. Okay. Or if you bet on evens or odds, that's 50 50. Or if you bet on prime or not prime, that's 50-50. But if you bet on three or not three, then it's one sixth by sixth. So it, they always have to add up to one or 100 percent. Great question. They always have to add up or to one or 100 percent. But those numbers have to be equal to each other. And most of these are interesting because they're not equal to each other, and you get kind of skewed. Hence, this next one I want to look at, which is do that exact same thing, but do it five times. Yes. So in other words, we're not going to play the game just once now. We're going to play this game five times. Roll the dice, bet on 7 or 11, see what happens. Roll the dice, bet on 7 or 11, see what happens. Jesus, the program's long. I missed you. Let's make sure you have this thing so you can play. Yes. Okay. Hold that thought. Those are, that's, a good, that's a very good question, John. But because I can't do two things at once. Anyway, yeah, so oh, if you're doing any kind of rolls, it's going to be the same. You can't multiple Right. Each time it's reset to the Oh, good for you. You have fancy. Now you don't have to. Now you got them. Back to the same probability. So now, now John has a fantastic question. He actually, he has two questions, both of which are fantastic. Uh, the first was, does the chance of winning stay the same at 836? The second question was, or do we have to multiply by five somewhere? The answer to both of those is yes. <laughs> but you only have to do one of them or concern yourself with one of them because the program takes care of the rest. This is just like Max sending Max into the store and having him buy five chicks. It's exactly like that. Where getting a boy would be like rolling a seven or eleven, and getting a girl would be like not rolling a seven or eleven. Remember all that finagling we had to do in class with the numbers, the multipliers out in the front? Okay, Bertha's a boy, Marge is a girl, Nancy's a girl. Now we also got to consider Bertha's a girl, Marge is a boy. And we did all that finagling of numbers. That's where that five would come in, John, but it's taken care of automatically in here for you. Don't concern yourself with that. Do concern yourself with what's the probability of winning on a given trial, and we already know what it is. It's still 836. So two great questions, two great questions. Let's get in there and do it. Just fill. Now, least number of times you can win? Zero. 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 You might play this game five times and never win. The question I have for you is, would you expect that to happen? This will help us answer that. This helps us answer what kind of a game this is. How slanted is it against you or for you? That's the beauty of the program. Largest number of times you can win? Five. All five, yeah. Virtually impossible. Good. Now, that's the question. I can't do the, the fractions in my head, but this will do them for me, and then we can go back and analyze the distribution. Good. Uh, binomial again. Chance of winning on any given trial is going to be uh, uh, 8 36 Beautiful, 8 36 It says it's done. Go back and look at the distribution now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is the interesting part. This talks about how likely it is that we win this game. Now, when you look at five, this means you won all five times. Which means you won a seven or an 11 five times in a row. What does this tell you? Less than zero. Well, it's not less than zero. It's greater than zero, zero, but it's barely greater. It's an ask to three right zero before the five. Yeah, what you have to do is like boom, 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 boom. zero point one. There. Point it's five. point oh 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 five four. I.e., it's probably not going to happen. It's probably not going to happen. It's an outlier. Mm -hmm. Great. By definition of an outlier, that's going to be an outlier for you. Yes. Okay. Good. How about 
How about winning four times and losing once? Is that going to happen? Not likely. It's not likely because it's still less than 1%. One percent. Okay. Yeah. Now, it's more likely than this. And this is where, John, you're talking about the five. The five would come in here and also here. But it's already taken care of for you. Don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, not, it's still not likely. How about winning three times and losing twice? And Renee, very, very good. Renee goes, mm, because this is a no. This is a, that's a great response. Because what's that magic percentage we mentioned that happens in 244 a lot, the cutoff for unusual? Oh, five. 5%. Yeah. That's close to five, no. yeah? So it's kind of like, mm, it's like it's right on the borderline. So I don't know how to feel about that one. How do you feel about winning twice and losing three times? That's pretty likely. 23% 23, 23 of the time. That's one in five, one in four almost, yeah? That's pretty likely. How about winning once and losing four times? That's the mode. That's the one to bet on. That's the mode. That's the one to bet on what's going to happen. So one way is to offer the dealer a counter bet. I'll tell you what. <laughs> I'll play the game five times. If I win once, you pay me 500 bucks. See if it goes for it. I don't know. How about, how about losing every time? How about losing every time? Still pretty likely. The way I look at this, I kind of look at this as three different, as two different things. I look at it as that half and that half. Okay. I mean, you think about it, that's 90, almost 95% of what's going to happen to you. Means you lose more than you won. That's one way of thinking about it, right? This is a great gambling game, though. This is fantastic. I mean, this makes their money on average. Oh, on average, how many games would you win? Uh, we, we have on mode, right? We got it on mode. On mode, we're going to win one game. But what's the average? Down to like, like a tenth or a hundredth, probably I guess a tenth of a decimal place. 1.1111. One, 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 one. How are we getting these numbers? I don't know. Yes, you do. I do know, you just used it on your exam. How do you find the average? One bar stacks. Oh, right. There you go. Now, here's a question to think about. Could we find that average a quicker way? Without having to use, without having to use this, it's okay if you're not seeing it. You play five games. Each of those five games has a likelihood of eight thirty-sixths of winning. So on average, now this only—it seems like magic, but it only works for binomials. That's why I don't teach it that much because it only works in one specific case. And you guys already know one bar stats. So you just go to that every single time. But just in, in your mind, if somebody tells you, like, you're going to win, 830 seconds is about 22%. You're going to win 22% of the time. And then somebody says, well, if you play five times, you're going to win roughly one of those times. 22% of five is roughly one. So that kind of makes sense from a multiplication point of view. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Keep that in the back of your mind. And seriously, far back, because you got one bar stats to deal with it. OK, you ready? Yep. Let's do a couple more of these. Check out. Yes. Your favorite. Now, we've done this before in class with Excel simulating roles for us. What we're going to do now is get the exact numbers used in the binomial. Because this is binomial. Think about chuckle up. What happens in chuckle up? You win or you don't? You, good, good. But, but there's different ways to win. Do you remember how the different ways to win are? Were. Is. Are. <laughs> you pick a number and then you do what? You either roll it or you don't. What do you roll? Three dice. That's the key. The key is it gets interesting because there are three dice in this game. We're throwing three dice, and you're betting on, say, a five, like I said here. So how many different ways can you win? Technically speaking, there's three ways three, to win. Right. You can win one small amount if you roll one five and two non-fives. You can roll a, a larger amount if you roll two fives and one non-five. And you win the grand prize, which you guys analyze for this quiz, if you roll all three fives. So what you're interested in in this game is not so much winning or losing, because there's one more way to win, but you're interested in what? Quantity. The quantity of fives that you roll. That's what you're interested in. How many fives, when you throw three dice, what you're interested in in chuckle luck is how many fives you got. What's the least number of fives you can get? Zero. You might get zero and lose your ante, which we talked about. What's the most number of fives you can get? Three. I think we're there. Let's do it. I think we're there. Zero to three, yeah? I didn't say yeah that time. I said yeah. Back to the East Coast. It's binomial. Now, the kicker with this one is don't overthink this. You're betting on the number of fives. The fives come up one on each die. Mm -hmm. The chance of a five is what? Six. One in six. It's one in six for each die, because that's what you're interested in. Each die comes up one sixth of the time with a five on it. Yeah. Don't overthink this. 
Now, what's, what it's going to take care of, this is just like Max and the Chicks. One sixth chance of a girl, five sixth chance of a boy, and so forth and so on. What it will now take care of when you go into your stack editor, these numbers should look pretty familiar to us. They're not exact. We had slightly different values from class. If I remember correctly, our value here was a little bit larger because we had that weird, I had just mentioned you never get three fives, boom, 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 we got like five of them in a row. Like, well, there you go, it's a fun little outlier occurrence. But this is very close to what we got, isn't it? Exceptionally close to what we got. So this is the way you would get the exact values if you needed them. You'd run dist fill on the binomial, because it is binomial. On any one of those three dice, you either get a five or you don't get a five. This makes it binomial. Beautiful, huh? Mm -hmm. Pretty straightforward. Let's get away from gambling. I mean, gambling's great at all. But let's talk about more like, like social science, psychology, biology kind of stuff, because this is where you actually use this stuff. And gambling's great and all. But talk about this. Read that. Is it binomial and thus can we can make a distribution for it, or is it not binomial and thus we could not? Okay, so it satisfies the have it or don't bit. I like that. They either do or don't have red green color blindness. There are other parts of that definition of binomial we haven't talked about quite yet. One part was that you have to have a fixed number of trials. And this is fixed. Because you don't get 20 guys. Okay, that's it. There's one part that you have to assume sometimes that sometimes is legit and sometimes isn't. This is the third part. That's why there are three. Check, check, check. And then check. So, so we got the bi part, the binomial part. We like that. But the constant the, complementary part that, is trial Good, trial. good. Let's talk about that. That's the one I want to chit chat about right now, what Madeline just mentioned about. Remember the discussion we had? We talked about Max pulling the chicks out of the bins. We used 90% every single time he pulled a bird out of a bin. And then we said to ourselves, that's not exactly right, is it? Because when he pulls a bird out and puts it in the Happy Meal box and I take it home, it isn't exactly 90% girl anymore in the bins. It changed. It drops. But it drops, right? But why did we say it was okay to pretend that it was 90%? Because the population was large enough. Population huge and a teeny tiny small sample means we can assume it's 90% each time. It all rounds 90% to three decimals or four decimals. Can we do that here? No. I think we can. Really? Look, we're drawing 20 guys from American men. Okay. Boom. How many American men are they? Throw a number out there. Let's say, say it's 90 million, the low ball. 90 million, you're drawing 20 from 90 million. I'm thinking we can, we can call that good. But how are you going to get consistent results if you grab 20 guys from that, you know? From the entire population of American and then do men. do it again, you're going to get the same results? That's what, that's what, that's, that, that, by definition, you have to, by mathematical definition, you're not changing. The numerator and denominator are so far apart from each other that removing one from this it mathematically doesn't affect the, the, the ratio at all. I agree with that. Good. I am just talking back to the binomial random variables point number three, the constant complementary probability. Is that still constant complementary? If we assume yeah. they're independent, it is. Okay. Which means we assume it's always 7%. Okay. No, I see what you're saying, Madeline. And what you're saying is mathematically correct. It's not the same. They're not constant because they are changing. But they're changing by one one millionth or something each time, which is arguably ignorable. And therefore, we can deal, we cannot deal with it. Is that fair? Yes. Okay, good. Very good point. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying we can ignore the fact that you're wrong. And, or ignore the fact that you're not wrong and do it wrongly because wrongly isn't that wrong. Who? Boy, that was the most confusing thing I've said in like three weeks. We can pretend it's independent because it's independent enough. So, make the distribution for me. Make the distribution in your TIs. I want to see this. I want to know how many guys on average should have red, green, color blindness if I draw a sample of 20. That makes sense? 0 to 20? Because we're keeping track of they do or don't have it. With a chance of 7%. Yes. It takes a little longer, yeah? Because there are 21 elements in this distribution where we've been the max of 5 recently. Go take a look at it. So if I draw 20 dudes, uh, what's the chance that none of them are going to have color blindness? It's a pretty, pretty good chance. It's a pretty good chance. 
color blindness is fairly rare, so you shouldn't have a, a very, very good chance. There's even better chance than one of them has. Pretty decent chance that two of them have, and then once you get far enough away from this initial clump of zero through three, all the rest become outliers. Why are, why are all the rest becoming outliers? Because if 7% of guys have red-green color blindness, you shouldn't be getting 5 out of 20 or 25% of your sample with it. That shouldn't happen all that often. It should happen less than 1% of the time, according to, to calculations. Why is this important? This is the kind of stuff you can bring into court to argue points. Uh, a civil action that moved with John Travolta in it years ago, like about 10, 15 years back now, they used an exact same argument in real life to talk about why cancer rates. If cancer rates in all the towns around this town are at this level, why would it be this level in this one town next to the big refinery? Mm -hmm. Why? Because it shouldn't be, but it is. And that's when you start questioning the 7% rate. And you say maybe the rate in that town is actually higher. You see the tie-in? I mean, yeah, it's all about chickens and dice and stuff until it's not. Until it becomes powerful. Please, I saw a hand. Shane, was it you? I thought I saw a hand. John, it was you. Go. Yeah, I, I was just computing, I guess. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I, I was just curious about the, uh, so would it be better if they, they actually took a smaller sample size? Well, when you say would better, be, what are you be, trying to accomplish? Well, it'd it make their statistic more, more true, I guess you'd say. So would it be better with a larger sample or a smaller sample? I don't, I'm not... What are you trying to get them to, to for the seven percent to actually be more more? Oh, this is this is this is seven percent perfectly right here. Okay, right. This is seven percent, ninety-three percent. Yeah, seven percent have, ninety-three percent don't. But knock the outliers off is what I'm saying. Oh, so. oh, oh! So, John, I love this. Everybody on your programs, program dist draw number six. Oh, excuse me, it's number one for you guys, number six for me. Sorry, just whatever, whatever number disk draw is in your machine. Disk draw and then just press enter. Oh, this is a This is a 2D look. I gave you disk draw and disk fill. Disk fill gives you a 1D T table. Disk draw gives you a, an image. So John, what John is saying is awesome, actually. He's saying just trim off the outliers and focus on the chunk of the curve that looks kind of like a what, actually. It's a truncated bell curve. Yeah. More on that on Monday when we get back together. But yeah, it's kind of like a truncated bell curve. Very Which important. is like a sample size of six? It, it's actually not. It's still a sample Five. size of 20. You're just ignoring this chunk because it never happens. But here's what we do in 244. We'll have this curve, and then we'll randomly sample some population that was exposed to some environmental variable. And then we might get a data point that lands out here. And we say to ourselves, hmm, that's interesting. If they were seriously a part of this 7% curve, the chance that they should be way out here is basically zero. So isn't it more likely maybe they're a part of a curve over here? And maybe that variable that we exposed them to actually increased the rate of RG, whatever the hell it is, CB. That's, you're, you're asking 244 questions, which are fantastic, by the way. But that's exactly where 244 heads is. We compare the presence of a data point on this curve and say, ah, that shouldn't happen, but it did. What does that mean? See what I'm getting at? Yep. That's a hypothesis test. That's controlled, varied, double blind hypothesis testing. Totally awesome. Totally awesome. Good so far? You guys go with us? Yeah. Okay, let's do another one. You guys are getting the hang of this, I think. Okay, read this one, if you would. Oh, wow. Some of you might, some of you might say, yeah, this is the same as the last one. It's not exactly. Binomial. No. Nick says no. I heard. I heard. Kind of. That was awesome. <laughs> Same with confidence, my friends. No. 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 Why is it not binomial? There's never trials. I. I did. This is like telling Max to go in the store. Max, here's a box. Keep buying birds till the box is full. You know, shove a few more in there. No. <laughs> go in and get four birds. That's what I told him. Go in and get four. The other one was go in and get 20 guys and check them for art. This is. This is desiring a success of 20 guys. And doing and whatever it takes to get to that point. This might take a while, yeah? With 7% outcomes, it might take a while to get to 20 guys. This is, the end result is different. We want to have 20 guys that have red, green, color blindness, not analyze 20 random guys to see if they do or don't. So it's a different question, right? Mm -hmm. It's a different question. This is not binomial. It's actually called geometric. It's, it's another fun distribution, which we'll not talk about anymore other than that. But it's not binomial. That's the key. It's not binomial. It's got great applications, just not for not for what we need for our social science and our, our consumption of Fox News. <laughs> How about this one? Okay. That seems fine. Okay. 
It's impossible today, because like, I can't select 10 men right from this class because there's only eight of us present today. That's okay. But supposing there were 10, it sounds binomial, does it not? It does. What problem do we have? The 10. I'm, I'm okay with 10. From this class, Andrea, which contains roughly how many individuals? We have 10. We have 10. Oh, we have 10? Yes. I'm not counting. I thought I counted, John. So we got 10. But even though we got 10, how many folks in the class? Red 25, maybe? Red 25? You're taking a huge, humongous chunk of the population. Every guy that is. Well, that, but the percentage of the population I'm removing each time is measurable now. Yeah. Removing one dude from a class, from one person from a class of 25 is removing 4% of your population off the bat. And then every person you remove past that is removing more than 4% of your population. Um, but that's not the population you're comparing it to. It is, if I'm talking about this class. I know, but it's but when you compare it to the first sentence of American men, it's still... Totally, but I want to see if this particular population has the same oh, percentage. So this is my population. Uh, okay. So the problem with this is, okay. you can't treat it as binomial because that independent assumption that Madeline so correctly brought up before falls apart. Okay, okay. It falls apart. That's the problem. That's the problem. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, good, good. That's, that's why you have to be careful with the binomial. Now, in general, in, in the in the usable world, statistics like Gallup polls and Rasmussen polls, they make, they make sure to go out and grab like 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 Americans of voting age. And they cover themselves that way. Because there are roughly, let's make up a number, 100 million voting age Americans in the country. And they're grabbing 1,000. So they're getting a small, tiny chunk of the overall. But when you start getting these studies into these studies where you have tiny, tiny populations like elite male cyclists between 32 and 34, and checking whether or not caffeine ingested before submax workout lowers heart rate. First of all, it's, it's mind-dizzying it's mind to think about all the implications of what that's talking about, but also thinking about the size of that population. It's tiny. You have to rethink your methods in that case. Christina is trying to process what I just said. <laughs> no, I, no, I like, <laughs> but you're with me. Yeah, yeah I mean, the thing is, is that those populations shrink exponentially, and then you've got to deal. This is called hypergeometric. This distribution right here, you use the hypergeometric distribution, which is another fun one. Uh, you guys might remember this one. A couple quizzes ago, in class quiz, you looked at uh, the New York State Lottery, those kids that paid close attention to the New York State Lottery in that one game where they doubled the outcomes and they ended up making money. To figure out, I gave you an extra credit opportunity to figure out the probabilities that was this distribution, hypergeometric, because you were drawing 20 balls out of 80. You're taking a huge chunk of 80 when you take 20. You're taking 25% of it. The same thing happens here. You can't treat that as binomial. It seems like you should, right? Either your ball matches or it doesn't match. Trick is, 20 out of 80, you've removed a chunk of the population, you have to keep track of that. I had a guy who just contact me yesterday working on a PhD, and I have to do the exact same thing with him, because he has this little tiny population, and he drew half of it, and he wants to do statistics on it. No problem. And he's trying to, he's trying to do binomial. I'm like, mm, time out, you can't do that. And I explained to him the exact same thing Madeline just explained to me, about the whole idea you're, 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 you're destroying your population percentage-wise by overdrawing. So I saw a hand, I thought, did I? Renee, please. That's a fantastic question. There is not, but there's like an accepted rule to use. If you're drawing more than 5% of your population, you shouldn't use the binomial. So it's that same 5%, but it's a different context. Did I ever hear a question? It's fantastic. Because I've been very, very coy about it, you know. Oh, you, you can't draw too much. Oh, that's okay. That's not, a, that's not too much. But where's the cutoff? When does it become too much? The, the generally like industry accepted rule, if you pull more than 5% of your population, reconsider using the binomial and use something else. You get more accurate numbers. So that's why drawing a thousand out of a million is not a big deal. It's way under five percent. But you, drawing ten out of thirty is way above five percent. You're at one third then or thirty three percent. Are you John, talking about the same five percent for the two no, and a half? No, it's the same percent but a different reason. Okay. It's the same five percent but a different reason. It's the same okay. number but it's a different context. The five percent for outliers is a probability of occurrence. Okay. And the five percent that we're talking about over here with Renee is a five percent of the population. So one's a probability and one's just a ratio of count, so to speak. Same number. And that's what's nice about it, keep that in your head. 5% just shows up all the time in statistics. So, so you guys have been looking at, you know those you guys take psychology and sociology classes? Yeah. P-values. Yeah, P-values, 5% is always what you're comparing it to. And that goes back to what you were talking about before, John, with the probabilities are less than 5%. Oh, kind of fun, actually, speaking of that, is our last distribution. If you make a box plot on this, you guys did? I'm assuming you did. Yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, pretty cool. Hang on, let me change the window a smidge. Yeah, let's make the YMAX one. There. So here's your distribution, yeah? There's your histogram, if you will. Let's get this guy out of here. So there's that distribution we just had. Here's your box plot. Look at all those outliers. Yeah. Why are they outliers? Because the interquartile range is so tight. I mean, the interquartile range is measured between the 75th and 25th percentile. That's what, that's what this is doing. Well, if you look at over 75 to 25R, well, there's roughly 25 is going to be right there. There's 23. It's close enough. 75, that taken together is 60-ish, right? That's about 60. So 75 is going to be somewhere right about here. So once you, look how close they are. They're less than two apart. You stack less than two above the 75th percentile of one and a half, you're basically at four at that point. So that means that all your outliers up here, they have the first one they're calling outlier is four, and everything above it is four. And those just happen to have the probabilities that are, that are below, there, below the 5%. So it's a beautiful tie-in, a beautiful tie-in. Sometimes the outliers do agree with each other. They don't always perfectly agree. But this corresponds, John, I mean, if it's down here, it shouldn't happen. If it's out here, it shouldn't happen. It's the same shouldn't happen location. Yeah? What did you set your window at? I changed the Y max to one. That Thank just bumped you. up the box plot. Yeah. You. you didn't have to, but it makes it easier if they're not touching each other. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. See you guys again on Monday, yeah? Okay. Can you bring binomial questions? I have another 244 question I want to ask you. I'll, I'll save it for Monday. It's a nice bridge between oh, goodness. It's a nice bridge between uh, between here and the standard distribution, standard old distribution. So bring binomial questions for Monday. Make sure those things are rock solid. Then we'll finish the course, start the money. Yes? I want to grab this, but I can't see you. We'll figure out. Could one of you guys just turn the camera off and figure out? That'd be awesome. Hey, Brad. Let me do it. I'm going to break it up.